Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Halkett and I'm the Director of Strategy and Research on Cisco's Global Education Team. I'm delighted that so many of you could join us today. We hope that you will also be able to join us later this spring for the other presentations in our series that are listed here. For more information and to register for any of these, please visit our community website for education leaders, getideas.org. At the end of my presentation, we'll have time for a short question and answer session. As we go through the presentation, you'll see a small hand in the lower right portion of your screen. If you want to ask a question at any time, just click that on the hand and type in your question, and we'll address the questions at the end. I'll be speaking to you today about changes in the types of skills students need to succeed both in our global economy and on the new assessments now on the horizon. I'll be talking about what the researchers are saying, about the work that we've done here at Cisco, and what you can do to start to do in your schools to address this important area. I'm going to begin by looking at why America needs a new way of looking at skills for the 21st century. Because today's students are competing for jobs in a global marketplace, their level of achievement relative to their peers around the world is very important. Comparing international education performance is difficult, but this graph shows one of the best measures we have, the PISA data from the Programme for International Student Assessment from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This graph shows what has happened across OECD countries over the past four decades. Four things stand out. First, all but the lowest countries have done well in catching up. Second, the countries at the top have improved relatively little. Third, the US has slipped from first to 13th place. And finally, the gap at the top is increasingly narrowing. We are in an intensely competitive educational world. This data shows us that the US has topped out in the older style of education, and also that the old tests have topped out too. Countries are at the top that are at the top need to think again. We need to win at the next game, not keep chasing ever-decreasing gains in the old one. As you may know, both PISA and NAEP are developing new kinds of assessments that test a broader array of skills. And we at Cisco have partnered with Intel and Microsoft and the OECD on an effort that is just beginning in this area. More on this later. Most recently, and perhaps most importantly, the Obama administration is on board with the new thinking. As this quote from his education speech last week shows, I'm calling on our nation's governors and state education chiefs to develop standards and assessments that don't simply measure whether students can fill in a bubble on a test, but whether they possess 21st century skills like problem solving and critical thinking and entrepreneurship and creativity. The impact of these efforts may seem far away, but watch this space. Although in the past you may have been constrained to teach to the test, in the next few years new assessments will start driving curriculum and pedagogy towards 21st century skills. Before we can reassess why what we need to learn, it's important to review why we learn in the first place. And we think in terms of three main benefits. Obviously, learning has economic benefits for a country. Since a highly skilled population is one of the greatest determinants of economic competitiveness. More highly skilled people innovate more and are more productive. They also attract high investment multinationals that in turn attract high skilled workers, a virtuous circle. Second, Policymakers point to the social and environmental benefits of learning. As our social and environmental challenges increase, so does our need to innovate in response to them, to develop new technological and social responses, and to work together on implementation. Education also has wider social benefits. Your learning helps mine, and together we are more productive. More highly skilled people are less likely to need support by the state throughout their lives, and they commit less crime. It's less common to think of the li uh, impact of education on lifelong personal prosperity. But clearly people with higher skills are able to work in better jobs for higher wages for longer. They're also better able to deal with the economic shocks like the ones we're dealing with today. And they're more adaptable and resilient and can retrain more easily. And finally, learning improves the brain and makes it more resistant to cognitive aging. However, all of these benefits are under increasing pressure and maintaining them isn't about keeping pace. Thinking back to our earlier slide with the PISA scores, it's about endlessly trying to stay ahead wherever you are in the world. 
It'll come as no surprise for you to hear me say that the world is changing fast. And globalization and technology are the change factors that most impact our topic today. They have many implications for education systems, implications that are not always simple and straightforward. For example, globalization presents a challenge because jobs that used to be done in the United States and Western Europe are now being done around the world. But it also presents an opportunity because we can compete globally and benefit from ideas and products produced elsewhere. We've all heard that the world is flat, but of course it's not. It's spiky and uneven. Whether you look at populations or economics, some regions stand out as powerhouses, and others consistently lag behind. And this is mainly because of differences in human capital, people, around the world. Globalization is also putting pressure on the types of skills that are important. It means that we need more and more specialists in certain types of subjects, but specialists often find it hard to talk to one another, which means that we need more people who can bridge domains or at least be specialists with some wider skills. What we need what has been called the T-shaped person, someone with skills that are broad but can be deep in at least one area. Technology, of course, is moving faster than ever before. This doesn't mean that we all need to be technologists, far from it. But it does mean that we have to be able to work with technology. And, most importantly, the students of today need the skills to work with technologies that haven't even been invented yet. All these pressures mean that we need more and better skilled people. This graph is from a technical economics paper from earlier this decade, but it shows a crucial point. All skills are not equal. The demand for skills depends on whether people are skilled in routine or non-routine tasks. If you notice, routine cognitive tasks actually decline faster in value than routine manual skills, probably because you can't outsource a restaurant. So this isn't really about which subject students study. It's not necessarily about STEM skills or other academic skills. It's about the ability to think and to confront difficult problems. Now I'd like to give you some context. Cisco began researching the implications of this debate for existing education systems several years ago. As a result, we developed a new vision of system change that we call Education 3.0. To briefly summarize this thinking, in Education 1.0, there were some schools that provided learning for a small portion of the population. In Education 2.0, reform movements emerged, prioritizing data collection, curriculum changes, and accountability. But this didn't take into account the demands of 21st century skills, nor what we're learning about how learning happens, nor the pressure from today's increasingly independent and digitally literate students. To address these needs, we developed a new vision of education, one that we've piloted across America and around the world, Education 3.0. This complicated slide shows the full Education 3.0 framework. It's made up of four pillars with a total of 71 components. We don't need to look at all of them today. You'll see that a 21st century curriculum is highlighted because that's what concerns us today and because 21st century skills are part of that 21st century curriculum. Here, we're breaking out the six elements of a 21st century curriculum, six groups of skills or subjects. First, what we call new basic skills, literacy, numeracy, and IT and information skills. Second, core and technical subjects that will be familiar to you all. Third, 21st century skills, which we'll discuss more in a moment. Fourth, disciplinary knowledge. This means that it's more about learning the scientific method than about individual pieces of physics knowledge. Fifth, a wide range of specialist subjects to engage learners really anything they want from art and Arabic to economics or music. Finally, ethics and citizenship so that students are equipped to properly apply the other skills and navigate an increasingly complex world. I'd now like to give you a brief tour of the thinking on 21st century skills. You may be aware that there's a lot of history to this topic, reaching back to the mid-20th century and thinkings like, uh, thinkers like Edgar Morin and Alvin Toffler. And more recently, in the 1990s, President Clinton's Labour Secretary Robert Reich has written about the work of nations and the future of work. What I'd like to do is briefly review some of the major thinkers in this field and also discuss the controversy that sometimes surrounds this topic. Be prepared to see some common themes emerging. 
One of the most important thinkers in this area is Harvard education professor and psychologist Howard Gardner. Howard Gardner's pioneering work on multiple types of intelligence is relatively well known, but he has since moved on from describing how the mind works to describing the five minds we need to excel in the future. He talks of the disciplined mind that excels at one way of thinking. He talks of the synthesizing mind that assembles and sorts information. He also talks about the creating mind that puts forth new ideas and poses unfamiliar questions. The respectful mind that tries to understand others and work effectively with them. And the ethical mind that considers the relationship between the nature of work and the needs of society. But students and the workers of the future need all of these. You can't just choose one. Daniel Pink is a writer and thinker who looks at the future of work and skills. His book, A Whole New Mind, looks at the world beyond the information age, which he sees as changing in several ways that lead to the six new senses that you see here. One way which in the world is changing is abundance, our ability to get hold of huge quantities of whatever it is that we want. Another he terms Asia, a shorthand way to talk about the enormous numbers of highly skilled people being released on the international labour market and the competition for jobs. And the third is automation, which leads to the impact of the end of routinized jobs like we saw before. He also talks about two new drivers, high touch and high concept. People want more than function. This means that workers need to be able to produce those services and they need to think, think about the difference between an MP3 player and an iPod. So the six new senses he comes up with are, first, a sense of design beyond function. Second, a sense of story, not just being able to assemble data, but being able to build a compelling narrative and an argument. Third, a sense of symphony, the ability to cross boundaries and see the big picture. Fourth, a sense of empathy, understanding what makes others tick, forging relationships and caring for other people. Fifth, a sense of play, which is important personally to stay what he calls mentally alive. And sixth, a sense of meaning that goes beyond accumulation and helps people look for actual fulfillment. The next contributor to our discussion is Tony Wagner, co-director of the Change Leadership Group at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, who wrote this book, The Global Achievement Gap, last year. By the way, Tony will be the next presenter in our series. In April, he'll be speaking about the global education gap, which promises to be a very informative session. Wagner has synthesized the, the several previous viewpoints and created seven survival skills. He describes the gap between the new world of work and what he calls the old world of school. His seven survival skills are therefore, firstly, critical thinking and problem solving, essentially being able to ask good questions, he terms it. Secondly, collaboration across networks and leading by influence, because organisations are growing and spreading out across time zones, they're also moving from top-down control to a team-based mode of working, and because higher skilled workers work better when they can work more autonomously. Thirdly, he talks about agility and adaptability, because they're needed because today's students need to train for jobs that don't exist yet. He talks about initiative and entrepreneurship because innovation is critical to both small and large businesses and the public sector. Fifthly, he talks about effective oral and written communication because it's critical across the board. It's a core skill that appears on the list of educators and business leaders everywhere. It doesn't just mean good grammar and vocabulary. He means the ability to build an argument or a narrative, much like Daniel Pink. Also, accessing and analysing innovation, uh, information. Students need those skills because just finding it is no longer enough. They need to know what's important and how to appraise it, particularly in our information-rich world. And finally, curiosity and imagination. More than initiative and entrepreneurship, it's about being creative. Not, surprising, not surprisingly, Wagner is not a fan of the current multiple-choice standardised tests. He promotes the pioneering alternative tests that are, can be seen around the world as a far better approach to assessing the progress of students. Many of you will be familiar with P21, the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, a cross-industry think tank based in Tucson. 
The P21 framework is perhaps the most complete and is currently being used to varying degrees in 10 states around the United States. Arizona, Iowa, Kansas, Maine, Massachusetts, New Jersey, North Carolina, South Dakota, West Virginia and Wisconsin. By now, many of the skills will be familiar, but P21 goes one step further and talk about what's needed to implement them. The circles at the bottom of the slide that you see. Standards and accountability, curriculum and instruction, professional development, learning environments. The core subjects are the academic subjects we're all familiar with. The 21st century themes include global awareness, financial literacy, civic literacy and health literacy. They reach across subject boundaries. The learning and innovation skills include creativity and innovation, critical thinking and problem solving, and communication and collaboration. The information, media and technology skills include information literacy, media literacy, and ICT literacy. Finally, the life and career skills include flexibility and adaptability, initiative and self-direction, social and cross-cultural skills, productivity and accountability, and leadership and responsibility. In our final synthesis, Andreas Schleicher, who's the head of PISA at the OECD, often uses this list of six attributes students need today. He talks about the need for collaborators and orchestrators. The more complex our world becomes, the more we need various forms of coordination and management. He talks about the great synthesizers. We used to be able to break down problems into manageable bits and pieces, but today we create value not from a, a value chain, but from synthesizing different pieces to build a new whole. Schleicher also thinks that explainers are increasingly important as the amount of content increases. He says that we used to talk in, think in terms of specialists with deep skills and narrow scope, and generalists with broad scope and shallow skills. But today we need what he calls versatilists, who can apply their skills to a widening scope of situations, gaining new competences, building new relationships, and assuming new roles throughout their life. Then there are the great personalizers, are needed to revive interpersonal skills, skills that may have atrophied to some degree because of the industrial age and the internet. And finally, the great localizers, who take global ideas and make them relevant to their nation or region. As I mentioned earlier, the teaching of 21st century skills has been controversial in some quarters. One charge is that this is nothing new. They have been teaching these skills for a long time. Another objection is that skills don't take away from the need for knowledge. And a third goes something like this. How do you teach a course on creativity anyway? We would say there's a, in response that there's a false dichotomy at the heart of most of these objections. It's rarely about one choice or the other. It's about both or about more and better. Yes, these skills have been taught in the past, but the push towards standardized tests has meant that content has become the priority over the past couple of decades, and this is an imbalance that needs to be corrected. 21st century skills are certainly not all new. Remember when you worked in, with partners back in chemistry class? That was collaborative learning in action. Also, 21st century skills do not take away the need for knowledge, and the point is not to teach courses specifically on most of these skills. As I mentioned before, and we'll get to later on, 21st century skills need to be integrated throughout the curriculum to support better learning and teaching. They cannot be taught, taught or learned in isolation from content and knowledge. That's what gives them meaning. Before we examine some pioneers in implementation, it'll be clear to you that there is plenty of overlap in thinking about 21st century skills, and you've probably already built your own list. What is certain is that this cannot be nicely laid out and boxed up. Teaching these skills requires interpretation and personalization by teaching professionals at all levels of the education system. Of course, a major barrier facing the movement towards 21st century skills is that of assessment, as I mentioned earlier. At the moment, schools complain of having to teach to the test, and current tests don't assess 21st century skills. We at Cisco recognize this barrier, and we are now part of an international movement to drive the issue forward and determine the feasibility of testing for these skills on a standardized basis. This year we've established an independent academic structure linked to the OECD. We've started five working groups, and we hope that the thinking we develop will be deployed in several countries, including the US, in 2010 and 2011. We're aiming for inclusion in the OECD PISA tests in 2012. 
Now I'm going to take a look at the brief look at some of the innovators in this area. Despite the assessment barrier, some innovative schools are moving ahead with the 21st century skills agenda. The New York City iSchool is a new way at looking at high school for the 21st century. Interdisciplinary, problem-based modules that include individualised online coursework, college preparatory core uh, experiences and off-site fieldwork. Real-world problem problems drive the curriculum and projects are designed to foster collaboration, interdisciplinary and critical thought and promote anytime, anywhere learning. The school focuses on the development of student skills critical to the success in the 21st century, such as communication and technology. And although the school only opened in September of last year, the early indicators are good. The school has already received about 1,500 applications for about 100 slots next year. The RSA Academy in the UK is a new school sponsored by the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce. About 100 schools in the UK, including the RSA Academy, are using their innovative Opening Minds framework, the curriculum that advocates the teaching of five categories of competence you see here. The RSA Academy itself, which is located in Tipton in the West Midlands, goes one step further. Operating a different school day, with two three-hour lessons each day, five terms a year, and up to 90 children in a class at one time. At High Tech High in San Diego, they have embedded 21st century skills in project-based learning. In this example, an 11th grade teaching team centered its math, science and humanities coursework on an ambitious investigative project around the local wetlands. As you might expect, a wide range of 21st century skills were involved. Innovation, critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, team building, media liter literacy, and many more. The students loved it. They discovered a new world in their urban neighbourhood and one where sc their schoolwork actually mattered. And they eventually produced the striking field guide you see here, Perspectives of the San Diego Bay. This is a great example of 21st century skills in action, integrated with content and knowledge. Many educators from other districts are now visiting High Tech High and the other seven schools in the area that are part of the same consortium to see how it can be done. Finally, it's important to note that students in this school perform well on standardised tests and at the moment 100% of them go on to college. Clearly the school has been successful in engaging them in learning and teaching the basics of a curriculum as well as 21st century skills. So how do schools get started on this new path? Probably the most critical element is professional development and there are several excellent professional development programmes available now that incorporate 21st century skills for example through Lesley University and the Harvard Wide World program. When teachers learn how to introduce 21st century skills into the classroom, they need to be practicing them, learning hands-on how to collaborate, work in groups and so on. You can't learn 21st century skills in 20th century ways. And remember that students often don't learn by rote memory, they learn by thinking and doing. So give them a chance, you may be surprised at the results. Finally, we at Cisco do not believe that we have all of the answers on this topic or that we can set an agenda for change without your help and without the input of education leaders around the world. That's why we've set up a public service website, getideas.org, as a place for education leaders to collaborate on a new vision for change. We urge you to visit Get Ideas and join the dialogue on global educational transformation. And please don't forget to register for other presentations in the series. We value your input and look forward to seeing you on getideas.org soon. We'll be back in a few moments to answer your questions.